Well, welcome everyone. I'm Jonna Tuttle, and I'm the manager of the Environmental Heritage Program here at SNCA. And I'm grateful to the Environmental Heritage Committee for uh, helping to host this program today. Um, in addition to the work of thinking through it, they uh, brought goodies. <laughs> So we'll have some refreshments after the presentation. So basically what we're doing today is gathering you, a group of people that care about the valley and about what this place uh, is and becomes. And so we'll have a, a presentation by Alan Stovall and Will Wagner. Um, but we'll also, uh, for as many of you who will stay, we'll have a discussion afterward to talk about what's important to us and, and where we go from here. So I hope you'll stay for that. Because uh, we want to keep things moving, after Alan presents, we'll have a few questions. Um, so to keep that um, efficient and condensed, what I'd ask of you is that as questions come up during his presentation, if you'll write those down, and then there'll be a time when you can pass those up, and then we'll get to um, the core question while he's still at the podium, but there'll be more time to discuss after the break. Does that make sense? I think most of you know, but very important detail, the restrooms are over here. <laughs> um, so there are a few people that I want to acknowledge here. Uh, one, if you somehow don't know, we have a new director at SNCA. So welcome to We also have with us their board chair, if you don't know her, Linda Harris in the back there. And do we have any other board members here? Yeah, where's your hand? Joyce and James? Okay. And um, there's also a lot of people that have worked on preservation and land use issues over the years and you are here in the audience with us so we'll ask you to participate through this and and so that we can all better understand together what's happened over the years since the preservation study um, i'd like to share with you our working mission statement for the environmental heritage committee I've got this posted in a couple of places so you can see it. The mission of the SNCA Environmental Heritage Committee is to preserve and protect the natural and culture, cultural environment of the Saute Nacuchi area through community engagement and education. Our vision of the natural and cultural environment includes native plants and animals, as well as the natural features of the land and historic cultures and sites. So, and thank you Kathy Chadwick who's part of our committee for helping to uh, pull that together with the thoughts from the committee. Um, you'll notice in that statement that it's not only the environmental issues that we're interested in. There are so many places where the environment and culture and history touch and I think Alan's study certainly points to those <coughs> interconnections and so um, in this committee we're uh, not taking on the work of other committees but um, finding the places where the environment is enriched through those interconnections and how we can protect through those interconnections. If you're on, a lot of our committee members couldn't be here today, but if you're part of the uh, Environmental Heritage Committee, if you'll hold your hands up. So you can talk more to them today. So before uh, we introduce 
Allen. I'd like to introduce Will Wagner, who's also going to be presenting after. So uh, Will is here. Will's the general manager at Smith Gall Woods State Park and Hardman Farm State Historic Site. Um, and in more recent times, uh, he's, he's playing a, an important role in the community by uh, being the chairperson for the historic, what I think is called the Historic Preservation Committee, uh, which was, um, is part of the work of the Planning Commission in White County. So he's going to present a little bit on the historic district overlay, uh, which they've been working on for a couple of years now. And uh, now we'll have, we, we're fortunate to have several either previous directors or interim directors among us in this room. Uh, and one of them is Jim Johnston. Uh, so he's going to come up and introduce us. Alan told me to make it brief, so I will. Um, <laughs> Alan was fortunate to be born here with the love of this place. And we're fortunate to have him as our um, landscape professional and who has been in academia almost forever, and uh, as well as private practice. Anyway, for y'all who don't know, this is Alan Sowell. And he's going to give a presentation. <laughs> uh, I do have permission to remove my mask so that we can uh, get this on video and make some sense sound wise. Uh, why are we here? This is a question that I think we asked ourselves 40 years ago. Why were we here? And I think it can best be summarized in the handout that you have before you, which has a little cover sheet. And on the inside, there's a left column on the forward. And then on the right side of that, it gives the goals and objectives of the study. But I want to read the last paragraph on the left column at the bottom. And you can look at it with me. A few places. Georgia, equal in beauty and serenity, and Sati and the Gucci Valley. Even fewer places of citizens who take the initiative to preserve the qualities that make their place so special. What this study offers is a plan and an approach where the recognition of values from the past becomes an integral part of a plan for the future. So, uh, this, this is the sheet of paper you can write your questions on, by the way. The other two uh, parts of the handout are the last two pages. And one is called a, an illustrative preservation plan that has lots of notes on it. And uh, that's something I'll explain when we get to, toward the end of the presentation. And then, of course, the uh, what we call the implementation matrix, which is a springboard for what we were proposing at that time to do for the future and we can begin to see where we are in, in that process. I'll skip the most uh, not, uh, recognizable uh, <laughs> image, I think, of the valley and that's the, the mound and the, and the, and the, and the uh, landscape uh, across from the Hardman House, but also the Hardman House is part of that whole compound, as is next to the uh, Presbyterian Church, which at the time was built uh, right about the time of the Hardman House by Captain Nichols. At that time, it was a uh, Baptist church. But anyway, uh, oh, Presbyterian church, I'm sorry. So anyway, uh, as we uh, move on down the road, we're looking at resources that uh, were uh, yeah. documented in the in an earlier Nakuchi Valley uh, study that had been initiated by the State Historic Preservation Office. So at the time we began our study here, uh, Nakuchi Valley had just been approved for national register status. And then, of course, uh, we recognize the variety of structure types uh, that we just looked at. And, uh, of course, the other end of the study is the Sauti Valley and the covered bridge across Chicago Creek. 
This is also known as the Stovall Mill Cover Bridge. <laughs> okay. In 19, um, by ni in 1980, the Coochie Valley had been uh, uh, added to the National Register. Uh, what was discovered was there's very little that, that could be done from that designation to, to plan for the future. So what, what we really have here is a study that proposes a preservation plan or a process for uh, planning for growth and change in the future. And what you see in the slide here is the group that met, represented by the State Historic Preservation Office there. Uh, I'm there, uh, Bill Crittenden, who was president of our SNCA at the time, and a couple of consultants, and Dale Yeager were also in the group there. So this was uh, a, a meeting to discuss the parameters and the study area itself. So if we look at this slide here, and we, you can actually can read it, <laughs> but we're looking uh, not only at the saw tea and the Gucci Valley, but uh, in discussing this, uh, I felt that we really needed to include the view shed, that, we, that it would include the mountain ridges and hill ridges around it that, that define the actual study area. Because it's my belief that the, the most, the, the big, some of the biggest threats in addition to valley floors is going to be the hillsides where people would build and have these wonderful views. This um, image gives you then the, uh, it's a map that shows one at the bottom in the Coochie Valley uh, Historic District uh, and extended up to the 1400 contour. So that's, that's the, the bottom sort of uh, not within the shaded area. Uh, and then the Sati Valley would be following that 1400 foot contour and what would that preserve? So felt like we really needed to address the view sheds uh, that uh, you would particularly see from the roads and, and from other structures. And so we took this up to the ridge lines of uh, prime snows Lynch Mountain and over to Sal Mountain. So that's, that defines then that study area that was discussed at that, that meeting that we talked about there. Uh, this gives you um, a real view then of what that area was. You can see the contrast between the, the uh, Nakuchi Valley, which is running east and west, so is the uh, like, um, open area over on Dukes Creek. And then Santee Valley runs to, to the north and, and east and at the top of the screen there. So this gives us then the, the real place that we're talking about. Uh, one, one of the instructive parts was just to look at what are the current ownership patterns here. And so we went to uh, county maps, e-maps, and plotted those on a, on a map at the same scale of all the others. And what you're seeing here is not only the, the, the uh, Ownerships, they vary in size. The, the carbon property is down on the lower left in that particular area, but also others that were sizable. And up on the top is, is a project that Don Carter developed and bought the land and had developed it already. Uh, so it's, it, it was a recent sale back in by my cousins, <laughs> people in the family. It had been part of the Stovall estate. Down to the very bottom is uh, land that belonged in the, in the Williams uh, families there, uh, and um, those uh, had sold within the, within the family. So there was a lot of that kind of activity was going on, and there's some others around there as well. So that uh, that was done, and then the next slide. Uh, which I won't show you, but what that one was, <laughs> if something happened to it, and, uh, is that it showed the areas that, that had existing protection, which essentially were waterways, uh, some covenants on certain parcels, but about 90, 90 at least 90 percent of the, uh, the whole valley area had no kind of protection at all. Okay, this is the kind of springboard into how we um, conducted the study. And from the, from the outset, it was vital that we engage the community and the process that we went through all the way. There's nothing worse than having consultants coming in, finishing a study, and leaving town. 
what we had to do was instill the people this is their ownership it was an opportunity not only to participate but be the co-authors you might say of what was being proposed so that was important we um, we developed a, a plan for three workshop sessions uh, these were held at the presbyterian church across the street here uh, these were done on a uh, Wednesday night. They ran about two hours to two and a half hours. Uh, and they were two weeks apart. And then the third workshop was actually a mobile workshop. Again, we began in the morning there, uh, boarded a bus, uh, nine to one, and toured the valley area up and down 17, uh, Highway 255, Lynch Mountain Road, all of that. Uh, and is there anybody in here that was on that tour? You'll have to take them. Okay, kidding. You'll have to take our words for it. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, we, we made about six stops just to uh, allow people questions and comments. And we learned a lot from what people said. And so we had facilitators along there uh, during the bus tour. But more to the point here, this is the first uh, session we had, and I see Curtis Starr and, and Pat, uh, what was Pat Bristol before, um, and, and I can't tell everybody that's in, in the group here, but we would uh, meet uh, in the beginning, uh, it's a format, we'd meet in the beginning, give instructions about what we're going to do, talk about the assignments we're going to accomplish during the session, and at the very end, we'd have a kind of wrap up of what we, we learned. So this is how we operated in about 45 people, broken down into about six or seven different areas of the church, uh, sort of in circles, with somebody busy recording the kinds of things that were discussed and, and, uh, and, and the results of those. The, uh, the first workshop focused on what were the values that people cared most about. And then the second part of that discussion was what are the things that they perceived as threats and were concerned about. So we had the concern for values, commonly held values, and commonly held uh, threats that they felt. This is, uh, may, not, may not be very easy to see there, but it is a chart that takes the, uh, the question of what is valued, and those were listed on a flip chart on the wall. And if you go down to there, there's several things that people value, the, scen the scenery, the, the river, the mountains, and other things. And the, and the green uh, stickers that you see, if we go to the next slide, represented a way of saying the, the, the four most important things to you, use the green stickers and put beside that. So we had people coming up uh, doing that. And so, so the reason for that is this is before computer days, <laughs> is that we were working from Charlottesville, Virginia. I was just finishing up my final year up there. And we took all this information back. We had to take things back with us that we could review so we could plan for the next session. So that's what we were doing with these kinds of sessions. Okay. Um, what was learned from that, uh, it was interesting to me, is the word scenery was a, uh, a concern or a value a part of what people saw here uh, and felt. So I would jargon is to say visual values in my field, but uh, we, took, we took that seriously and thought, how can we find out more about people's tolerance for change, particularly visual tolerance for change? So what we did was to uh, set up uh, two screens, uh, projector focusing images on each one. People in the audience had a, a sheet that had a format on it so they could uh, uh, rank things and so we would be showing slides that would show maybe maybe both want, both of them would be um, very positive or or say very acceptable acceptable not uh, barely acceptable or something and then totally not acceptable so there were four categories you could there was no middle ground so you had to be for it or against it uh -huh. okay so we went through those those were about 12 seconds on the screen purposes you don't sit there and think about it too much but you do react to what's being presented I didn't use slides that showed any 
finish things from the valley. I wanted to keep this objective. So I took things from Northern Virginia where I'd done a, a bit of consulting work and uh, it replicated the conditions we had here, which were valley floors, hillside developments, et cetera, both good and bad. So that's what we were using to gauge people's visual reaction and their, at one degree, do they accept things or reject it? So we can move forward all the time building a case like the, like the you know, current, what you see on TV. We're building a case here for, um, uh, uh, for um, uh, having, meet, meeting all the objectives of the study. Uh, one of the things, again, the historic structures that were there, particularly the older ones, uh, the alley house we saw earlier, this, this is Sauti Manor from Lynch Mountain Road looking in the distance across Sauti Valley. You can see the Stovall House in the far distance, the Lumsden House over on the left, and of course just off to the right would be John Sosby's house. There's a lot of, so these older structures, most of them at the time uh, of settlement here, did uh, command these landscape views. And so you can see here how change in particular valley areas would be seen very uh, easily from all these areas. Uh, other examples would be driving up 17. This is across from, uh, I guess, Pat Dower's place uh, up there, the Dower family. And these are more or less fleeting kinds of uh, scenes that you see. But you can see here the kind of foreground and the middle ground and the background of Yona Mountain, all is part of that view and all is part of the uh, importance of memory and the heritage of this place. During that tour that I mentioned, a uh, four hour tour with the stops, uh, this is an example from over in front of the Sachi Manor looking back toward the Mikuchi School and, and in this general direction. And so that, again, people had an opportunity to talk about historical things, and we had people along who were facilitators who were taking, taking these notes. And then uh, I guess this is, this is one that you'll recognize too, the brick commercial building at the Hardman Farm. Uh, one of our stops, again, where uh, the group was there, we, we, we toured in the bus, uh, but we got out to discuss things so we could hear each other. And, Okay, uh, meanwhile, a, a big uh, emphasis and concern about uh, the future had to do with what was happening in Helen. And this uh, particular slide shows uh, Helen in the foreground, which is um, pretty much on the one side of the river, and then on the other side, there's a little bit of development, and then it's pretty much vacant all the way down through there. So at that time, even then, we could see uh, Helen being promoted as an alpine village. Uh, of course, a lot of, lot of visitation to Unicoi and so forth. So these, these, these things, along with mounting pressures for second homes and that sort of thing in the area, were uh, again in the background of everybody's mind. All right, this is a uh, chart that is not in your handout. And I will um, just, whoops. I will attempt to um, explain it a little bit to you. We'll be on this one in a couple of minutes. I guess so. Again, everything were to be done as guided by the purpose of the study and the objectives of the study. What we'd be doing in um, Roman numeral two here is essentially the research and uh, inventory and mapping and analysis of what we were finding out. This got, fell into categories, uh, the cultural categories, of what, what the existing land use was, the archaeological sites, historic structures, and also results of the visual survey. I'm going, I'm going to project, talk about this one. This is the one that shows the environmental characteristics in terms of things that we that were that we, we knew that we could lock into regulations uh, uh, slope soils water resources that's what we 
these, these then were synthesized and we combine all these into a single map. I will show an example then of how the assessment of this led to the uh, synthesis map here. This was done in all three and then combined. And then in the end, we again identified areas of highest preservation need or protection, protective need. Okay. To, to take the physical features, this is a slope map and it shows us areas uh, by degree of <coughs> darkness. Uh, most uh, the steepest areas, for instance, about 30% would be the blackest. And you get down into various grades to uh, flat areas. So this, you know, again, soil erosion and other disturbances, visual and so forth, that you would get uh, in trying to uh, do anything in these areas. This this was an important map we we consulted with the USDA soil surveys of the county and everything that was considered a class one or uh, prime agricultural. Uh, soil we mapped and this basically uh, in the shaded area shows us in the two valley areas how much of that again uh, covered prime agricultural soils there in mind protecting uh, promoting agricultural use and protecting these soils was part of our objectives and the third one that I'm showing uh, is an example of uh, water resources. You've got the, the, you can see the Chattahoochee River, and dark the dark line. It's it's tri tributaries. It also includes the floated the floodplain uh, taken from the Corps of Engineers Upper Chattahoochee Flood uh, Management Program. It was an official document, and that's the ones with the vertical lines. There's also some horizontal line areas that just show wet soils. So again, we're looking at things that, that basically saying that so they, these are problematic, they, these offer you know, health, safety, welfare issues. And so we, we need to respond to that in our, in our planning. Okay. Now, if you're tired of looking at maps, uh, we got the real thing here. This is around 1949 or 50 or 51, and I can't remember the date on it because we don't document it in the study as a date. But this was taken from the local uh, soil conservation office here in the county, which was very helpful uh, for us to be able to see that. And it shows you over on Santee Creek, that's on the old bridge, just before you get to Route 255 up there. All that whole part of Santee uh, Valley was was played and of course we, that's the only slide I could find where it was but it still confirms pretty much uh, I'm saying 100 <laughs> percent close to it uh, what we were mapping and that was important for people to understand now just just going with the physical constraints this is a map that represents those values and concerns and in a way of trying to identify and identify areas it would be based on those those kinds of problems and constraints or protective measures um, important to, um, to to preserve. This is the first in of there were three separate maps done that way. We located uh, our historic sites, archaeological sites, areas of visual uh, values and so forth. And we did the same thing with uh, but the biotic, we looked at wildlife ecotones and we looked at <coughs> the, the vegetation patterns. It would be the hardwood forest would be uh, ranked higher than, say, pure pine forest. So we used those things to combine. Oh, I'm sorry about this. Some things are maybe not in quite the order you were expecting. Uh, one of the things that we did was to try to develop an understanding that when you look out across the landscape, there are various zones. And um, you can think of the foreground uh, and the middle ground area and then the background area. Unfortunately, the slide doesn't show the background area here, but you can imagine what it is. It's, 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 
This is over Saatchi Valley, like you get from Lumsden, Crichton House up there. But anyway, it gives you an idea. So anything that happens in the foreground uh, will uh, will interfere with anything that falls behind there. All, all areas, uh, this is one that clearly shows that there's a, a middle ground of open area uh, and then a, a background. But keep, keep in mind that there's some areas where you don't have anything but foreground, and that's a purely forested area, for instance. Uh, we won't, we'll talk about the top one on the left, and then I'll swing over to the right. Uh, the bottom one is block left, is too complicated to talk about if you read it in the study. At the top, you see uh, what we have some circles, and I'm referring to those as visual impact nodes. Again, that's jargon for you, but it's a point where until you, until you reach that place, as you enter the valley, you've been in a sort of contained, visually contained area by wooded uh, edges. And then once you drop down into the valley floor, uh, let's just talk about from uh, Clarksville. You're looking up in the Coochie Valley, and it's a very different valley than anything you would have passed if you'd come from Athens here. I mean, I'm telling you, there's just not any place quite like that. And then, uh, I'm a little biased. <laughs> and then, same thing over here. If you're coming from Cleveland direction and you cross the bridge and you look down the valley and you see the mound and you see the openness and so forth, so these 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 become immediately recognizable kind of iconic uh, uh, entrances, if you will, entry points. The other thing was not only uh, the view from the road, but also there was a view from these particular historic structures that were here before, their siding and how how important it was to have. Uh, use of the fields and the valley floors. And also, in this case, you can see views between the structures to each other. So there's a kind of uh, keeping your eye on your neighbor. Uh, again, with hollering, you could, you could also announce there's hot killing day and things like that. But anyway, this, this, is, uh, this was important, we felt, because we're talking about, again, uh, things that uh, offer protection. This is the objectives then that's in the study. Uh, you can read them quickly here. Keep in mind that everything that we're doing uh, was related then to, to the goals and objectives of what we set out to do. Had to be, had to be that way. So this is where we had the, the common, uh, uh, kind of common ownership of, of all the participants uh, that were here. Okay, now if we try to say, well, what did all of this um, separate mapping mean when it's pulled together? And again, um, if we, today if we did this, we'd be using computer graphics and it'd be very quick to do. This all had to be hand drawn, if you can imagine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I had uh, two people that worked on this. This, this thing, totally, these were huge sheets. But anyway, you can see from this, as it has been said, the valley floors are, are really important for reasons um, of the flood hazards and the prime soils and, and all that stuff. And then, it, and then it's also important because the archaeological sites, uh, they, were, they are there, and, uh, and the, visual, um, the visual vulnerability to, to change and the need to protect and be concerned with what happens there. The, uh, the other restrictions would, would come uh, up uh, around the mountain uh, mountaintops themselves and the ridges and the, and the slope and the wooded areas in between. And maybe we go to the next uh, slide at this point. This, called, this talks about zones. It's taking the previous map and saying, well, okay, there are certain areas here where there is existing development, and those might show up as white areas. Um, the uh, Hardman complex uh, buildings, 
school complex here and so forth. Uh, the other uh, white areas are areas that, again, have the, uh, don't have the restriction of slopes uh, themselves, but uh, you'd have to find, uh, and these would be the general areas that you might want to steer uh, uh, land uses and uh, like housing and so forth. Um, and then all those shades in between would have uh, uh, special requirements and or guidelines for, for development to allow that to take place in those zones. So now we can get real again. So if you think about the zones that were just discussed and you see these A, B, C, D, E zones, which are in this case very much visual zones, the A would be those areas with severe development restrictions. And this is where we want to protect uh, by law and otherwise, uh, Hillside Protection Act, for instance. Uh, zone B would be an area that might have some potential for development, but with very, very careful guidelines. Uh, again, for visual reasons for uh, septic and all the other kinds of things that would be involved in, in, in an erosion from disturbance. The C zone would be those areas further down the slope and, and uh, uh, they typically have soils that percolate, they typically have, they're wooded, they're, they're kind of high what's happening. And so these, these became the zones that we would say that would make the most sense to have uh, uh, land uses that would evoke some change. The um, D area would be the valley floors, which we talked about how important those are for so many reasons. And they, they would be something we want to find ways to maintain that uh, openness, open character and protection. And then the zone along the highway, uh, the E zone, which is really the kind of foreground view, is important because anything that happens along the roadways is going to be either blocking or either contributing to or distracting from what happens behind it. So anyway, this is part of just trying to understand how the maps before uh, would, would, would be translated into how things might happen in, in the future. This, this is a uh, drawing that I think might be either the last page or the next to last page. Can you hand out? It's called a, an alternative preservation plan. It's a title on it. But what I'm going to, I'm going to do is I'm going to pull off about three uh, notes on that, on that drawing. Um, this really takes um, back to that green that we saw before with objectives and so forth. This really takes um, um, this area right here. And, it's, and again, we're trying to, uh, if you look at the map, it says secure permanent protection and use for the Nichols Hardman Building Complex and Bottomland Area. But we now know that this has happened. It, it happened with the state's uh, acquisition of that through the, the Hardman plan. Um, another one would be. Uh, Upland land uses with again uh, subject to development standards and guidelines. We're talking about upland here being above the 1,400 foot contour. And then the another one would be above the 1,600 foot contour would be to. Um, and that's down in, it's, it's, it's shown in a couple of areas, conservation zone above 1600 foot elevation. Again, this is again calling attention to um, uh, these, these particular areas and zones and their, uh, their potential use and or need for protection, what kinds of protections. This, this is the last slide. We'll spend a little bit more time with this. This is one that will uh, is a kind of springboard into the future and also into, to some extent, what Will will be talking about. But uh, I'll try to make, make this simpler for you. If you look here and here, 
those two uh, things at the top, you've got a list of preservation concerns, and they're, they're listed in, in the vertical kind of writing there. And then on the right side, it says development concerns. So just keep those in mind, and you can look under there and see what we're talking about in terms of uh, uh, what would be for preservation issues or concerns. Down on the uh, left side, this points to levels of authority and or uh, um, responsibility uh, that can be uh, used uh, in achieving some of those uh, issues over here. And under the individual um, uh, voluntary things, you can see individual stewardship, restrictive covenants. I like to use the word protective covenants. Uh, we shouldn't use that word. <laughs> I think we do now. Uh, scenic and conservation easements and, and so forth. You can see how across the board, in terms of volu voluntary uh, actions by individuals, can achieve a lot of the goals here. And just under that is, under, in, in the case of the county, just look at that too. In terms of uh, preservation goals and in terms of, of uh, development issues the county has a major a role that can play here through a comprehensive land use plan uh, zoning and plan ordinance subdivision regulations and then uh, the erosion and sedimentation control ordinance which has been approved uh, also since then in law so you have you have a lot of responsibility at the individual level and also at the county level if if we have the will to do these things. Down below you get a few things: the state and it, with the exes, uh, exercises either authority or assistance, uh, and then at the national level there are a few things. A lot of those are kind of scattered, uh, like Soil and Water Conservation Act of 1935. Again, that, that aligns itself also with a lot of the things above. So anyway, that's a, a kind of complicated um, table, but it's one that you can look at and think. And I guess I should mention that uh, all of the things, the things that I'm talking about are in here. Uh, if you want to get copies, I think Jimmy has some back here in the back. They're for, they're for sale, by the way. <laughs> And uh, I think I'll stop with that so that, uh, John, if there are any quick questions, I'd be glad to uh, respond to those. Does anybody have anything written down? Uh, one thing you may not be aware of is that um, this was the first time a study like this had been published. So it was considered at the time a prototype, as I've learned, uh, for other rural areas. And uh, Alan had kind of a road show back then, <laughs> going around to other communities and sharing information about uh, doing similar studies. Even made the national news, I understand. So one of the things that, um, that I think it would be helpful to know about. We'll, we'll take a couple of questions as you have them. Um, yes. Yes. Um, but one thing that uh, might be helpful to know is the context of of how this came to be. This study. What came before it um, in the the larger. Um, of things, uh, what was happening in Georgia. So um, uh, that's one question maybe you can address. Um, John's question is, what if any developments have occurred since the study that would represent disappointing actions? So, I mean, there may be somebody in the audience can, that can help with that, too. 
Um, or if you'd like to. Sure. I'll take the first question first, John. Uh, in the state of Georgia, uh, one, one of the early efforts toward conservation and, and, and based on, uh, it could be related also to economic values, was when Dr. Odom, Eugene Odom, the uh, ecologist, went down before the state legislature. And he didn't go down there wearing his laurels and all that stuff, or laurel things, or whatever. He went down there to say, we have an opportunity here to protect a resource that is as a vital uh, economic value uh, to the to the people here in the state. All we have to do is protect it. But we have we have this in perpetuity, uh, that is fisheries and so forth. So he was able to get the legislature to pass the, the uh, Marshland Protection Act, for instance. And and then John had mentioned that uh, okay, we we're we're down there in these special areas. Where else in the state will the mountains were at the sites of change and developers and so forth. So the mountains really, in, in my view, was the next big area that was a lot of things going on. A big canoe, a community over and um, northwest of here. Uh, at Sky Lake community actually developed. But there were lots of things that were going on that uh, uh, we could understand that the pressures were, were coming in. Uh, John's question was, what was it again? Oh, <laughs> uh, what, if any, developments have occurred since the study that would represent disappointing actions? Well, I'll get into real trouble if I... Uh, I, think, I think what we've had are some issues uh, along 17 recently. Uh, there was a proposal for a, an expanded uh, uh, winery operation. Uh, there'd be lots of parking up there. There were lots of things like that. The, the landowner bought this and wanted to, to, to do that. Well, suddenly uh, people were in an uproar here. Uh, he found out how much they were concerned about it and withdrew his plan to develop that. In fact, he was at the, the meeting and. Cleveland and I think supported what you know we're talking about here. So it's one of these things where there are been things like that. People were concerned down uh, 17 at the uh, Dollar General store or whatever it was. Is this going to happen along the Unicoi Parkway and so forth? So so that that's these are these are things that could have happened and haven't. We've been lucky so far, I think, in my view. If land is voluntarily purchased for the purpose of preservation, is there a tax benefit? Uh, we're getting into an area that I uh, don't want to make general statements on because uh, there are uh, there are advantages tax wise. And my wife Mary back there has gone through this with land that their family owns in Fannin County. Uh, along the Tupelo River. And so uh, the, the, under, the short answer is yes. <laughs> the idea is we're, we're getting all the questions on, on the recording. How can county conservation district be involved? Is that one you want to answer or should we open that up? Let's wait to answer the question. Okay. All right. So we'll hold that one. <coughs>
Will Wagner, come on up and Will will present on the historic district overlay that is um, currently being discussed by the White County Planning Commission. Good morning. It's hard to be the uh, chef's valid appetizer after Patrick Tebow and Andre, but uh, I will do my best. So my name is Will Wagner. I work for the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, uh, the State Parks Division. I uh, work at Smithgall Woods, uh, which is a natural resources conservation area, and also Hardman Farm State Historic Site, which is a cultural resources uh, uh, protection area. Uh, similar to what Alan was talking to about the different types of lands that we're looking at and how they uh, play a role, how they score points on what we need to do, what we need to focus on with conservation. Uh, so today I'll be uh, speaking to you on behalf of the role that I'm playing with White County, uh, which is as, as the chairperson, as John had mentioned, uh, for the Historic District Overlay Committee, which is the slide you see behind me. Um, I'd like to thank everybody that's done all of this hard work for decades and decades uh, so far. I, I, I would like to thank you all for letting me uh, jump in at, at this point in the timeline. Alan's uh, study was a major uh, resource for us, uh, very significant. We really couldn't have made the headway that we did without it, as well as a UGA study uh, that was done in 2015 as well that was a roadside study that cruised around White County and took pictures of historic sites as well. So that helped us out a lot uh, as we did what we did. Uh, so thank you all for, for playing your roles in that and letting us jump in and do what we did on that. So I've just got a few slides for you. And what I'm gonna do is basically tell you the methodology, how we, uh, who we are, how we came to be uh, in this committee and and what we are trying to do. Uh, so just want to introduce the committee a little bit. We were all folks from the uh, from here in White County that represented, represented a diverse group of folks. Uh, we were appointed by the White County uh, Board of Commissioners, and you can see the names on the list there uh, that were involved. And Blake Boggs came from real estate, Jason Hogan came from small businesses, Linda Dixon had been on planning and zoning, uh, John Erbley has a history here at Judy Lovell, uh, both in, in the history department. Uh, and then we had a couple of folks that were involved with um, uh, de facto people, Georgia Mountain uh, Resource Commission, as well as uh, John Sell from White County, uh, myself and Mr. Mike Pence, who, uh, Mike Spence, excuse me, Mike Pence, yeah, um, who represented, represented the campground uh, cemeteries here in White County. We wanted a really diverse uh, group of folks because our game plan coming into this was we knew that as we're developing this historic overlay district that we had to find a middle ground. We had to find something uh, that would be able to pass through the board uh, and be something that the planning and zoning department could use to protect these historic sites that we recognized in, in White County uh, as well as something that offers some layer of awareness, some layer of protection. Uh, it is a voluntary document that we have put forth uh, so that the protection levels are low and we're hoping that education right now is our main source of defense. So what we were tasked to do on the right hand side, you'll see the, the bullet points there. We were tasked with creating an overlay document, which we ended up uh, creating a six page document that defines uh, our mission statement, um, it defines the, the historic sites and their definitions that we tried to recognize. And it goes through recommendations of traffic, recommendations of what is a historic site and that sort of thing. The other uh, thing we were tasked with doing was creating a countywide map. So we have a countywide map uh, that shows all the different parcels in White County that are recognized as, as historic sites, as well as districts. The Salty Nakuchi district is represented in there, uh, as well as a handful of cemeteries and those large parcels of land uh, will be recognized on that map. We also put forth a letter of recommendation. Uh, you heard Alan speak about view sheds. That was one of the most important things that we tried to focus on during this. 
So one of the view shed recommendations that we wanted to say if White County was ever approached by the Georgia Department of Transportation, if the state ever approached White County with road improvements, that those view sheds were considered. We wanted to avoid uh, stoplights at either end of the valley and maybe uh, would recommend a roundabout or something that wouldn't impede on those slope views that Alan was referring to earlier. And the last thing we did, really the, the um, kind of biggest teeth that were in the package was to amend an ordinance. That particular ordinance was uh, a buffer around the cemeteries here in White County just to make sure that the development didn't encroach those uh, areas that are already protected. So we didn't introduce a new law there, but we wanted to further amend one that was already on the books. So our methodology uh, was to have several open houses. Uh, you saw in Allen's slides where there were open houses on Wednesday nights that he referred to, field trips and things of that nature to find out what the community thought. Uh, we went out and had, uh, you'll see on there we had three, one at Hardin Farm, one at the historic courthouse, and one at one of the particular camp meeting sites. And we published these in the paper. We invited folks to come out to them. Uh, we put on presentations about what we were trying to do and really tried to hear back from the community. Uh, we had very, very good turnout for the first two. We had about 50 people show up to both Hartman Farm and the courthouse. Uh, we had a nasty rainy day at the camp meeting, but a handful of people came out for that as well. Uh, but we wanted not only to hear what are good ideas, what are good protections, what are things that you would recommend, but it was also my position to play the devil's advocate and see who in the crowd would be opposed to such a thing. What can we say? What are the naysayers? Who, who would not like to see this happen and why? And that would help us further uh, build our package, build our recommendations so that this would be something that the Planning and Zoning Commission would buy into and that White County would in the end. Um, be able to approve or be able to adjust to. So one thing we also did was mirror the Mountain Protection uh, Act. You, you all may be very familiar with that and how it was quite controversial in its time, but it's now something we look back on as, as a major accomplishment here in White County. Uh, but we didn't mirror it because we, uh, were, at the time, were not really given the the, the green light to move forward with ordinances and so forth. So what we wanted to do was mirror it to create simplicity within the governing bodies of White County. And what I mean by that is we didn't want two completely different, different sets of rules on the left hand and the right hand so that you're always having to refer back to one and refer back to the other. So our game plan was to say, if this is section so-and-so in mountain protection, let's match that in the historic overlay protection as well so that you can bounce back and forth between the two. They are very related, as Alan referred to uh, during his um, presentation. You'll see a lot of that mid-slope level, I believe, is sometimes listed as, as B or C on his slides. That mid-slope level is a level that needs to be protected so that erosion doesn't get into the river and so forth, but it also needs to be protect, protected in, in regards of its historic view shed, what you're actually looking at there as well. So in that case, the cultural resources of historic preservation overlap with the natural resources as mountain slope pre pre uh, protection. So we try to kind of package those two together. And we also, we, we did meet monthly uh, for a period of time. Uh, our board did. We had these open houses outside of our monthly meetings. And then uh, everybody knows what happened two years ago and sort of halted the brakes on everything. We also had a string of county managers uh, coming and going. So that really pumped the brakes on things. So we've recently uh, got back into the fray of things and we have um, made a presentation to the Planning and Zoning Committee um, and put this on the table. Since then, we've had a second meeting with the Planning and Zoning uh, of White County, Planning and Zoning, uh, Zoning Committee of White County to further discuss what types of issues they have with uh, the document, with the map, uh, the ordinance, and the letter of recommendation with DOT uh, and, and started to try to chew this thing apart. Um, but in those monthly meetings, we, we refer, refer to the studies and, and so on. So 
So we did put forth some <laughs> overlay categories. Uh, one thing that became very prominent to us is that the board uh, was very interested in these cemeteries and, and those types of historic sites, the religious structures that are throughout the county and the history they play with so much camp meeting activity that's gone on throughout the decades here in White County. Uh, so we wanted to recognize the difference between those two. So we did identify historic and religious structures, excuse me, religious structures is, is, is one category and then residential and business structures is another uh, category there. And then we decided to um, take the benchmark of historic sites at a 90 year. Uh, we went back and figured uh, at this time, considering all, the, our, all the, the UGA study really pointed out a lot of different architecture from these historic sites for us. So we went back and considered architecture, we considered age, and made a 90 year benchmark and included all properties 90 years or older to be included in the historic overlay. So a lot of times we also realize that we're talking to, sometimes talking to folks at open house meetings or on the street or even in the political meetings that we have. Uh, and a lot of folks don't know these definitions that, that everybody in this room is quite familiar with. So we defined historic areas, defined a, a few sheds and uh, periods of significance. Um, so historic area is somewhat self definitive uh, but a few shed, a lot of folks don't really know what that means. And what we're referring to there is Alan refers to, uh, mentioned the Dollar General further up in the valley, but how that impacts the view shed of that part of the valley where you mentioned the gateways coming into the valley and how you feel when you come in and see this broad landscape almost with a, with a handful of, of minor things, you almost can see things as, as they were uh, back in a different time unless there might be a franchise on the fringe there that would block such a thing. So we just, that's how we just define the view sheds. And then period of significance, uh, I just mentioned that in the last slide, that's where we, we really looked at architecture and where that plays a role. As you all know, uh, different periods of architecture define different periods of time um, and changing of, of things that may have been occurring in England and how that reflected the colonies and then eventually what reflected further development in, in America and Georgia. So we wanted to capture those pieces and make sure that any outliers weren't neglected. The overlay map is really the main thing that they tasked us with, honestly, uh, was to put an overlay on Q Public, similar as, you, as the mountain protection is, the river corridors, the wetlands. Looking at Allen's maps, you'll see a lot of the different uh, areas that consider floodplains and these types of things that are already currently considered on Q Public. So when the overlay, excuse me, when the um, Planning and Zoning Committee looks at development, if they're just, a lot of times if you go to their meetings, they mostly talk about septic tanks and roofs. Um, but you'll see that those septic tanks are things that you cannot build in a floodplain area. So those are the types of considerations they're already looking at. The mountain protection uh, will show on Q Public on the tax map the slopes that are not, uh, you cannot be, make them devoid of vegetation. So, this map would also overlay uh, on the tax map and show these historic parcels as lands that are considered uh, something that we want to be um, purpose driven in our development. At this point, the overlay um, document that we've produced is all voluntary, but we still want, it, it, at the stage of the game we're in right now, to create that level of awareness and education uh, is, trying, is, is us trying to get that, that foundation built. Sort of jumped ahead a little bit a couple of slides ago, but uh, the cemetery ordinance, I believe, was uh, originally a 10-foot buffer, so we recommended moving it to 25, and the letter of recommendation with DOT, I mentioned about the stoplights at the end of the valley. Uh, also, we recommended, we, we did understand that the board was not terribly interested in another committee under White County. They did not want a historic overlay committee at this point. Um, it would oversee these types of things and create that additional layer that they're trying to avoid right now. So what we requested was annual reviews. If this document 
be reviewed every year. Uh, and that gives us a foot in the door to say, these, this is what's working. These are the changes that we need to be made. But what we hope is it would gain in popularity and allow us to build upon this document for years to come. And what we also really try to do in creating this document is be very open with the board that we are pro-tourism, pro-business, and pro-flexibility in White County. We just want to be purpose-driven as we move forward and understand what we have before we do something we don't want to see. So that summarized, uh, that wraps up my presentation. Just a few slides for you. Um, but just wanted to give everybody a chance to, to read uh, the summary, sort of see what our mission statement is, and understand where we're at with the Historic District Overlay Committee. The committee has been dissolved. It has sunset at this point. Right now, it's a document, uh, including the map and things and so forth, that has, is now being currently reviewed by the Planning and Zoning Committee. They are sending it back and forth to different employees within White County, including lawyers and so forth, and they want to change some of the verbiage in there, but we hope to um, that they'll bring us their questions and concerns and allow us to um, make some changes if need be, and we'll see at that point uh, when they vote if they decide to uh, recommend or not recommend it to the White County Board of Commissioners. Thank you, Will. If there are um, any quick questions for clarification purposes, um, Linda, did you have something? Yes. Um, why was the committee dissolved and who's going to be reviewing it if your committee's been dissolved? Why was the committee dissolved and who's going to be reviewing it? The recommendations, you know, or whatever. Upon its creation, it was designed to sunset in a year. That was the pre-plan. However, uh, the world shifted on us, so we had to put a few extensions in place, and we did end up keeping the committee for two years. Um, and but it was designed once the document was the document, the accompanying map were created. Uh, it was designed to dissolve. That was intentional. So now the document is living. The document is what remains. And it is now being going through the planning and zoning committee process as they vote to recommend or not recommend it. So I currently exist as its representative or spokesperson uh, as the former chairman. Uh, but, but the document still lives and now we're waiting to see what happens. Yeah, you, you mentioned though that about an annual review. Mm -hmm. So is that a voluntary review by the planning commission or? Well, it'll be up to the planning commission to see if they choose to keep that portion of our recommendation. We would like for it to be reviewed annually. However, uh, it'll be up to White County to determine if it is reviewed annually and then it'll be up to White County to determine who reviews it as well because the committee has some say. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question. Um, when I served on the on the uh, South County Board, I met with Senator Steve Gooch and um, had him put up those brown signs on uh, South Kingdom Coochie Arts and Heritage District that you see. And I tried to look in all the history books that I had to tell to put where to put to, to ask the Department of Transportation to put those signs out. Um, has there been been any problems with the designation of those signs, and does that fit with what the overlay and the history shows? I tried to get them in the right place. No, they've been positive. Uh, have they been okay? Just yes, just as. Could you Yes, there are several, um, as you mentioned, we worked with Senator Gooch, and this was just about I was coming in on board, so I was almost, yeah. I was basically an observer <clears throat> as this happened, but Senator Gooch did help the state of Georgia recognize the valleys as historic districts, and by yeah. doing so, 
uh, any cultural or natural resources are represented by the brown signs that you see on the highway and those were put up in place to give recognition as you come into the valleys uh, that you are in a historic area uh, but those have been positive and a lot of these uh, a lot of these steps we're taking even having a conversation in this room like we're doing now have all been positive because they show uh, the politicians here in White County that this is something that the community is interested in and it's just so in my opinion, is something we're just slowly chiseling at, trying to get to our goals as, as we're taking these steps. Um, one of the committee meetings, we had somebody come to the table and say, why do this at all? And you know, our response to them was that this is a step-by-step -step process. We're not going to have everything we want tomorrow, but if we can have one piece at a time, whether it be signage, whether it be an educational document that overlays our tax rec records and so forth, we hope that we're building uh, a better system to protect the valley with. And I would say those signs um, would definitely be a positive um, in that movement. What's your name, ma'am? Oh, <coughs> me? Um, <laughs> I've got um, <coughs> many. Helen Fincher, Arden. I used to. Um, work here and I, and, um, I ended up um, running the Helen Chamber of Commerce many years ago after I for the camera it. that's Miss Helen Fincher Harvin thank you <laughs> <laughs> all right well I hope you will all stay for more discussion um, a couple of logistical things one is I've got some questions in this discussion, not everybody will be able to speak or say everything that's on their mind. So I'm hoping that you'll take these questions and use them as uh, a, pl a place to think about and um, write down um, responses to these uh, about what's important to you uh, from the discussion and, and what you would like to see for the future. So. We'll pass these out. Uh, there are pens at the table if you don't have one. If you have additional questions for Alan or Will, if you write those down and leave them on the table. There is food and beverage. Um, if you will, if you wouldn't mind, um, so that it's just easier um, as far as uh, safety for safety purposes. Two things. One, please, uh, if you'll go outside on the porch, uh, enjoy being in the fresh air with your food and then we'll take about 10 minutes um, write some responses to the questions if you want to buy a copy of the preservation study courtney will be at the table to take your money and how much money do you want to take from that twenty dollars twenty dollars so um and I guess that needs to be cash or check. Good question. For now, cash or check. We'll figure something else out for later. Um, check payable to. Check payable to. Just write it to SNCA, just to make it easy. All right. So, any any questions? before we break up here. Okay, all right, 10 minutes. Um, enjoy food and conversation on the porch. Questions um, from before the break. Um, so the first one from, from Mary Gidell, how can county conservation districts be involved? So I'm not sure if, um, someone else wants to take this question um, if somebody has particular knowledge of county conservation easements I guess it would be okay um, well, one question is what uh, how can you make uh, conservation easements legal and all that if you get a, a land trust or some entity like that who can hold the easement, the best thing to do would be to get the attorneys together with the land trust 
and, and do it through a land trust, and that way it can be it can be enforceable that way. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Where is Mayor? Oh, okay. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Well, it sort of came from the fact our daughter is with the National Resource Conservation Service in Washington. Okay. And she talks a lot about conservation districts and how they work with the conservation districts. And I know enforcement or regulations are different from one state to another, but I just didn't know if there was anything in Georgia that had some sort of um, way of conservation districts working with landowners. Uh, I don't know of any association like NCRS in Georgia. By the way, you know, Chris Delaport um, headed that. You remember Chris Delaport? He was director at Unicoi. In fact, my, my whole career started with okay. <laughs> my whole career started with Unicoi and the Tallulah Board Studies. So, but Chris was ahead of he was hired by George Mountain Authority to run the, the uh, Unicoi. Uh, I don't know. I, I can see uh, if I can find a better story. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. I've seen property that has a 10 year easement, they get a tax break, um, and then they can sell. The, the CUDA, uh, which is a conservation use uh, uh, device that uh, landowners can have to, to, to keep their taxes and an agricultural assessment. Uh, they have to be renewed every 10 years. I have that on my land over here. And uh, it's, it isn't permanent, but it's renewable. So that's one answer. I mean, that's the answer to it. Uh, and, and you have to have at least 10 acres. I just, where, who is the owner? I was just talking to. Uh, anyway, uh, it's a minimum of 10 acres to be able to qualify for that. But um, that doesn't stop you from going to a land trust or some entity that can hold permanent easement. And that's that's the way I would suggest uh, maybe doing that. <coughs> Mary, do you want to? Probably another topic of, you know, this, can, this group is great to come in, have somebody come in and talk about tax, mm -hmm. yeah. tax base, tax uh, <coughs> opportunity for uh, preservation. Thank you, Mary. That was a good lead in to uh, one of the things that actually we did this spring have someone come in from uh, a Tennessee land trust, a mountain conservation trust, and, and speak about what conservation easements are and the benefits of them. Um, so we'll continue through the environmental heritage program to do that. and. We'll have other speakers over time just to help us as a community understand better some of the options that are available to landowners. So let me ask you this, are there any questions for clarification of what Alan or Will spoke about? Any, anything that's unclear about what was said? Okay, great. All right. Any other general questions? Okay. Let me. I, one thing that I would like to ask you: um, What are some things that um, you, you know? There are people in, here in the room and in the community that have had um, different, been in the community for different time periods. So, um, are there <coughs> efforts that? that you're aware of that haven't been um, spoken of yet um, towards um, land use protection um, the two yeah John John Maloon come on up if you will <laughs> just, just so for posterity <laughs> me <laughs> Again, a few years ago, the uh, Etheridge family, one of the families, 
owned a large parcel of land behind the Presbyterian Church over here. And they decided that it was time they didn't want it or need it anymore. Do I have to start all over again? A few years ago. A few years ago, <laughs> the Edwards family owned a large parcel of property uh, around and behind the Presbyterian Church across the street. They donated it to the University of Georgia, and uh, University of Georgia gets those kinds of gifts periodically. Most universities do. They don't want it. They're not in the business of raising cows or whatever the property might be used for. And there was a lot of concern about when they put it up for sale. The congregation of the Presbyterian Church, as an act uh, of being part of the community, uh, elected to purchase the uh, property for the express uh, uh, purpose of preservation. Uh, not going to build a mega church. It's there to be left alone for perpetuity. And uh, that is the kind of involvement and commitment uh, that people in this community have. It was, uh, and it was people, it's not a church, it's not a congregation. It is individual people from this area. It was a big deal, I thought. Yeah, thank you. what you said about the ownership of land 
is that I feel like it's very important that we let people who want to come to this area and to be part of it to understand what our cultural and historic and natural values are that are here. And I think, again, what you mentioned earlier about the um, people who wanted to do the wedding venue on Highway 17 um, and how the community came together and said, no, we don't think that's, that's not a good fit for what we're trying to do. Um, Hardman Farm certainly does a good job, I think, of letting people know. I mean, in the place that Emory Jones has done, is letting people know what the historic interest is here. And um, I think one of the recommendations in your study was education and doing tours and having programs and, and just letting people know um, the significance of this place. No, just for the recording, uh, for, for the recording, the, the comment is about um, when people come here new to the community, uh, what are the ways that we can educate them about our, the people that have been here, cultural, historical, and interest in the, in the natural environment, what we hold dear, how do we share that? The point of your of your remarks here, uh, believe Mary, are being proactive and not reactive. And I think being proactive, uh, education is the basics of this. The thought just occurred to me, and really just something in the audience, so we'll throw this one back at him. I think if we need. I think SCA needs a concise kind of educational document that could be available to all realtors. It could be available widely up here. And maybe and it's something that's not black and white and, and, and kind of hard to understand like this, but something that can be a, a piece that informs people. Uh, and that, to me, would be a, a great idea, along with somehow in civics classes in our school system, uh, using that as a vehicle for uh, understanding values of place. One of the things that the Environmental Heritage Committee recently talked about was um, educating realtors about that very thing. And so for any of you who have uh, a best way to do that, to provide that information, to disseminate that information, uh, I'd love to hear more about that afterwards or by email or other conveyance. Any, any other... Um, comments about um, land use action that have taken place that have been effective or not effective. All right, nobody's jumping at that. So um, in the last few minutes, I'd like to hear about any ideas you have or um, concerns about how things move forward or how things are moving forward uh, and what we can do. I, okay. I was thinking earlier about the things that I know these are studies and all that are used as tools. They're not regulations or anything at this point. They're supposed to be used by our county people as a tool to maybe think about regulation for certain things. But, one of the things is I know the county has given tax breaks to businesses to come in and get a business for jobs and community and so forth. And a lot of these old historic places, these homes don't, it takes a lot of money to keep one up or to renovate it and still keep it in the same character. And should they get a tax break for that basis in order to keep it in the county as a historic site? So, um what are, are, should there be, are there, how could there be tax breaks for owners of historic property? Yeah. Is that? Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 25% tax break is available for, uh, or for commercial use of properties, adaptive reuse of properties like that. And uh, that's, that's in law on, and it's, it's, it's handled. So there is that provision that we could use if it's an historic structure and you're following the guidelines that, um, uh, 
National Trust, I mean, not the National Trust, but Historic Preservation. What am I trying to say? <laughs> anyway, there are guidelines, and, and that could be done. That's it. Any other things that, ideas, things that you'd like to see happen as either um, a way forward or specific actions that you think are important? Well, what I'm hoping, um, and what we've talked about in the Environmental Heritage Committee, is um, having an ongoing group that comes together to discuss um, land use issues, but also the, the community and the sense of place that we have and how we preserve that. Um, so we're, we're formulating how that will happen. Um, Penny Pinson, a former director of SNCA, is very interested in helping with that process. So we have been talking with her about that. Um, uh, we're hoping to have something available uh, by the end of August uh, to start that uh, point of discussion. Um, and again, we'll have other presenters in uh, to help us understand the issues. If you have suggestions for presenters, um, please let me know. You can email me or call. Did you have something, Kathy? Yeah, I just wanted to say I think it's also important in the scope of this to um, have the Environmental Heritage Committee and the Environmental Heritage Committee about the Native American history here and find ways to honor that and include uh, protection in the kind of, you know, the cultural stuff that we're talking about. I know most of what we've talked about has been kind of European history related. Um, so I, I, for me, that's important. So Kathy's comment is just remembering um, the Native history and culture um, and finding ways to honor that. It's a, all right. Um, the other thing is, as, as we move forward with the process, uh, we want to make sure that we can be in touch with you and let you know what, what's happening. So if you haven't given your contact information at the table up front, if you would do that on the way out, and we'll keep you informed about what's happening. Thank you so much for being here today. And, Thank you, Alan. I was going to put on the sign that we needed to protect our uh, one of our local historic um, treasures, but <laughs> <laughs> I did.